Please give a warm welcome here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna it's um, Francisca, Teresa, and Judith. Judith, uh, you have the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We believe that scientific performance indicators are widely applied to inform funding decisions and to determine the availability of career opportunities. So those of you who are working in science or have had a look into the science system might agree to that. And we want to understand evaluative bibliometrics as algorithmic science evaluation instruments to highlight some things that do, um, that ha that do occur also with other algor algorithmic instruments of um, evaluation. And so we're going to start with a, yeah, with a quote uh, from a publication in 2015 which uh, reads, as the tyranny of bibliometrics tightens its grip, it is having a disastrous effect on the model of science presented to young researchers. So we have heard the talk of Hanno already, and he's uh, basically um, talking about, also, also talking about um, pr problems in the science system and the reputation um, by um, the indicators. And th the question is, is bibliometrics the bad guy here? So um, if, if we speak of tyranny of bibliometrics, who's the actor doing this? Or are maybe bibliometricians the problem? And we want to contextualize our talk into the uh, growing movement of reflexive metrics. So those who are doing science studies, social, science, social studies of science, scientometrics and bibliometrics, the movement of reflexive metrics. So the basic idea is to say, okay, we have to ac accept accountability. If we do bibliometrics and scientometrics, we have to understand the effects of algorithmic evaluation on science, and we will try not to, do <laughs> not to be the bad guy. And the, um, yeah, the main mediator of the um, science evaluation, which is perceived by the researchers, is uh, the algorithm. So I will hand over the microphone to, or I will not hand over the microphone, but I will hand over the talk to Teresa. She's going to talk about edification of scientific evaluation. Okay, I hope you can hear me now. Yes. yes. Ah. Okay. I have the so last part. So when we think about the science system, what do ex we expect? What can society expect from a uh, scientific system? In general, we would say reliable and truthful knowledge that is scrutinized by the scientific community. So where can we find this knowledge? Normally in publications. So with these publications, can we actually say whether science is bad or good, or is there better science than others? Um, in the era of digital, digital publication databases, there's big data sets of publications, and these are used to evaluate and calculate um, the quality of scientific output. So in general, with this metadata, um, we can tell you who's the author of a publication, where's uh, the home institution of this author, or uh, which types of citations are in the bibliographic uh, information. So this is used uh, in the calculation of bibliometric indicators. Uh, for example, if you take the journal uh, citation, the, the journal impact factors, which is a citation-based indicator, you can compare different journals and maybe perhaps say which journals 
are performing better than others or if the journal factor has increased or decreased over the years. Another example would be the Hirsch Index um, for individual science, which is also widely used uh, when scientists apply for jobs, so they put these numbers in their CVs and supposedly this tells you something about the quality of research those scientists are conducting. So with the availability of the data, um, we can see an increase in its usage and um, in a scientific environment in which data-driven science is established, uh, scientific conduct decisions regarding hiring or funding heavily rely on these indicators. And uh, there's maybe a be naive belief that these indicators uh, that are data-driven and rely on data that is collected in the database is a more objective uh, metric that we can use. So um, here's an, a quote by Rita and Simon. Um, in this brave new world, trust no longer resides in the integrity of individual truth tellers or the veracity of prestigious institutions, but is placed in highly formalized procedures enacted through disciplined self-restraint. Numbers cease to be supplements. So we see a change of an evaluation system that is relying on expert knowledge to a system of algorithmic science evaluation. In this change, there's a belief in a depersonalization of the system and the perception of algorithms as the rule of law. So when looking at the interaction between the algorithm and scientists, um, we can tell that this relationship is not as easy as it seems. Algorithms are not, in fact, objective. They carry social meaning and human agency. Uh, they are used to construct a reality, and algorithms don't come naturally. They don't grow on trees and can be picked by scientists and people who evaluate the scientific system. So we have to be reflective and think about which social me meanings the algorithm holds. So when there is a code that uh, is used, in, that, that the algorithm uses, there is a subjective meaning in this code and there is agency in this code and you can't just say, oh, this is a perfect uh, construction of, of the reality of scientific systems. So uh, the belief that this tells you more about the quality of research is not uh, a good indicator. So when you think about the example of citation counts, the algorithm reads the bibliographic information of a publication from the database. And so scientists, they cite papers that relate to their studies, but we don't actually know uh, which, which of these uh, citations are more meaningful than others. So they're not as easily comparable, but the algorithms give you the belief they are. So relevance is not as easily uh, put into an algorithm, and there's different types of citations. So the scientists perceive this use of the algorithms also as a powerful instrument, and so the algorithm has some sway above the scientists because they rely so much on those indicators to further their careers, to get a promotion, or uh, get funding for their next research projects. So we have a reciprocal relationship between the algorithm and the scientists, and this creates a new uh, construction of reality. So we can conclude that governance by algorithms lead to behavioral adaptation in scientists. 
And uh, one of these examples that uses the Science Citation Index uh, will be given from Francisca. Thanks for the handover. And yes, let me start. So I'm focusing on reputation and authorship, as you can see on the slide. And first, let me start with a uh, quote by Eugene Garfield, which says, is it reasonable to assume that if I cite a paper that I would probably be interested in those papers which subsequently cited as well as my own paper? Indeed, I have observed on several occasions that people prefer to cite the, the articles I had cited rather than cite me. It would seem to me that this is the basis for the building up of the logical network for the cita citation index service. So, actually, this science citation in index, which is described here, was mainly developed in order to solve the problem of um, information retrieval. Eugene Garfield, also founder of this science citation index, short SCI, noted or began to note a huge interest in reciprocal publication behavior. He recognized the increasing um, interest as a strategic instrument to exploit intellectual property. And indeed, the interest in the SCI and its data successively became more relevant within the disciplines and its usage extended. Later, Price de Sol, another social scientist, asked or claimed for a better research on the topic as it currently also um, meant a crisis in science and stated, if a paper was cited once, it would get cited again and again. So the main problem was that the rich would get richer, which is also known as the Matthew effect. Finally, the SCI in its use turned into a system which was, and still is, used as a reciprocal citation system and became a central and global actor. Once a paper was cited, the probability it was cited again was higher and it would even extend its own influence on a certain topic within the scientific field. So it was known that, there, that you would either read a certain article and it would, uh, people would do uh, research on a certain uh, topic or subject. So this phenomenon um, would rise to an instrument of dis disciplining science and created power structures. Um, let me show you one example which is closely connected to this uh, phenomenon I just told you about. And I don't know if, I if here in this room there are any astro uh, astronomers or uh, physicists. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there are a few. Okay, that's great actually. So in the next slide, here we have a, um, a table with a, window from two, a time window from 2010 to 2016. Um, and social scientists from Berlin found out that the co-authorship within the field of um, physics uh, extended by 58 on a yearly basis in this time window. So this is actually already very high, but they also found another very extreme case. They found one paper which had around about 7,000 words yeah, and um, a mentioned authorship of 5,000. So you would, f uh, in average, the contribution each um, scientist or researcher of this, pa of this paper who was mentioned uh, contributed was 1.1 word. Sounds strange, yeah. <laughs> and so, of course, you have to see this in a, a certain context, and maybe we can talk about this later on because it has to do with ATLAS, a particle detector which uh, requires high maintenance and stuff, but still. So the number of authorship, and you can see this regardless which uh, scientific field we're talking about, generally increased the last years. And um, 
so it remains a problem, and especially for the reputation, obviously, it remains a problem that there uh, is such high pressure on nowadays researchers. Still, of course, we have uh, ethics and research requires standards um, of responsibility. And for example, there's one, there are several ones, but there's one uh, here on the slide, the Australian Court for the Responsible Conduct of Research, which, which says, the, the right to authorship is not tied to a position or profession and does not depend on whether the contribution was paid for or voluntary. It is not enough to have provided materials or re routine technical support or to have made the measurements on which the publication is based. Substantial intellectual involvement is required. So, yeah, this is, could be one rule to work, to work with or to work by, to follow. Um, and still we have the, this, this problem of re reputation which remains and where I hand over to Judith again. Thank you. So we're going to speak about strategic citation now. So if you put this um, point of reputation uh, like that, you, you may say, so the researcher um, does a find something in his research and his or her research and addresses the publication uh, describing it to the community and the community, the scientific community rewards the researcher with reputation. And now the algorithm, which is like perceived to be a new thing, um, is mediating the visibility of the researcher's um, results to the community and is also mediating the rewards, so the um, career opportunities of the funding decisions and so on. And what happens now and what is possible to happen is that the researcher addresses his or her research also to the algorithm in terms of citing those who are um, evaluated by the algorithm who uh, he wants to support and also in terms of uh, keyword, uh, strategic keywording and so on. And that's the only thing n which happens new, may, might be a perspective on that. So the one thing new, the algorithm is addressed as a recipient of p scientific publications. And it is like far-fetched to discriminate between so-called invisible colleges and citation cartels. Um, what do I mean by that? So invisible colleges is a term to say, okay, people are citing each other, they do not work together in a co-working space maybe, but they re do research on the same topic and that's only plausible that they cite each other and if we look at citation networks and find people citing each other, that does not have necessarily to be something bad. And we also have people are, who are concerned uh, that there might be like citation carousels, so researchers citing each other, not for um, purposes like the research topics are closely connected, but to support each other in their uh, like career prospects. And um, people do try to discriminate those invisible colleges from citation cartels ex post from looking at metadata networks of publication and find that a problem and uh, we have a discourse on that in the bibliometrics community so and I will show you some short um, yeah quotes what people like um, yeah talk about how people talk about that, those citation cartels so, for example, Davis in 2012 said, George Frank warned us on the possibility of citation cartels, groups of editors and journals working together for mutual benefit. So we have heard of, uh, about the journal impact factors, so they, um, it's believed uh, that editors uh, talk to each other, hey, you cite my journal, I cite your journal, and we both uh, will boost our impact factors. So we have... Um, people trying to detect those cartels and uh, Manjin and I uh, wrote that we have little knowledge about the phenomenon itself and about where to draw the line between acceptable and unacceptable behavior. So we are having uh, like moral discussion so about research ethics 
And also we find um, discussions about the fairness of the impact factor. So Young et al. wrote, disingenuously manipulating impact factor is the significant way to harm the fairness of the impact factor. And that's a very interesting thing, I think, because um, why should an indicator be fair? So the, to believe that th we have a fair measurement of scientific quality, relevance, and rigor in, in one single um, like number, like the journal impact factor, is not a small thing to, thing to say. And also we have a, detec uh, a call for detection and punishment. So uh, Davis also wrote, if disciplinary norms and decorum cannot keep this kind of behavior at bay, the threat of being delisted from the JCR may be necessary. And so we find the, the moral concerns on right and wrong, we find the evocation on, of the fairness of indicators, and we find the call for detection and punishment. And um, when I first heard about that phenomenon of citation cartels, which, which is believed to exist, I had something in mind which sounded, or it, it sounded like familiar to me because we have um, a similar uh, information retrieval um, discourse or a, a discourse about ranking and power in a different um, area of society in, in search engine optimization. So I found a um, a quote by Page and Al, uh, who developed the, Google, uh, the, the PageRank algorithm, so the Go Google's ranking algorithm in uh, 1999, which has changed since then a lot, but um, they wrote also a paper about the social um, implications of the information retrieval by those indicators, um, by the PageRank as an indicator, and wrote that these types of personalized page ranks are virtually immune to man manipulation by commercial interests. For example, fast updating of documents is a very desirable feature, but is abused by people who want to manipulate the results of the search engine. And that was um, important to me s to read because we also have like um, a narration of abuse, of manipulation, the um, perception that, that that might be fair, so we have a fair indicator and people try to betray it. And then we had in the early 2000s, I recall having a, a private website with a public guestbook and getting link spam from people who wanted to boost their Google page ranks. And um, shortly afterwards, Google decided to punish link spam in their ranking algorithm. And then I got lots of emails of people saying, please delete my post from your guestbook because <laughs> Google's going to punish me for that. And we, we may say that this um, search engine optimization discussion is now somehow settled and it's um, accepted that Google's uh, ranking is useful and they, they have a secret algorithm, but it, it works and thus it's widely used. And Although the journal impact factor seems to be um, transparent, um, it's basically the, the same thing, that it's accepted to be useful, and thus it's widely used. So the journal impact factor, the SCI, and the like. And we have another uh, analogy, so that Google decides which, decides which CEO behavior is regarded acceptable and punishes those who act against the rules, and thus holds an enormous amount of power, So uh, which has a lot of lots of uh, implications led to the um, spreading of content management systems, for example, with uh, search engine optimization plugins and so on. And uh, we also have this um, like power concentration in the hands of Claire Witt, uh, former Thomson Reuters, who um, host the database uh, for the general impact factor and they decide on who's going to be indexed in this, those uh, journal citation records and uh, how is the algorithm in detail implemented in the, their databases. So we, we have this um, power concentration there um, too and I think if we think about this analogy we might come to interesting um, yeah, um, thoughts. But um, so our time is running out, so we, we're going to give a take-home message um, 
too long didn't read. So we find that the scientific community reacts with codes of conduct to a problem which is believed to exist, the strategic citation. We have database providers which react with sanctions, so uh, people are delisted from the journal citation re records, um, or journals are delisted from the journal citation records to punish them for citation stacking. And we have researchers and publishers who adapt their publication strategies in reaction to this um, perceived algorithmic uh, power. But um, if we want to understand this as a problem, we don't have to we don't have to only react to the algorithm, but we have to address the power structures. So who holds these instruments in, in their hands if we talk about uh, bibliometrics as an instrument? And we should not only blame the algorithm, so hashtag don't blame the algorithm. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you to uh, Francesca, Teresa and Judith, or in the reverse order. <laughs> but um, thank you for shining a light on how science is actually seen in, in its publications. And as I started off as well, it's more about scratching each other a little bit. I have some questions here from the audience. This is the microphone too, please. Yes, thank you um, for this interesting talk. Um, I have a question. You may be familiar with the term measurement dysfunction that if you provide a worker with an incentive to do a good job based on some kind of metric, then the worker will start optimizing uh, for the metric instead of trying to do a good job. Um, and this is kind of inevitable. So when, don't you see uh, that maybe it could be treating the symptoms if we just react about code of conduct, tweaking algorithms, or addressing power structures, but instead we need to remove uh, the incentives that lead to this measurement dysfunction. So uh, you refer to the, so I would refer to this um, phenomenon as like perverse learning, so learning for the uh, grades you get, but not for uh, your intrinsic motivation to learn something. And um, that's, um, yeah, we, we ob observe that in, in the science system, but if we only adapt the algorithms, so take away the uh, incentives, would be like, um, yeah, do not, uh, you wouldn't want to evaluate research at all, which you can uh, probably, yeah, want, want to do. But uh, to whom would you address this, um, this, um, call like, or this demand. So please do not um, have indicators or... So I give the question yeah. back to you. <laughs> so if I... Okay, questions from the audience out there on the internet, please. Your mic is not working. <laughs> okay, then I go to uh, microphone number one, please, sir. Um, yeah, I, I want to have a provocative uh, thesis, but I think the fundamental problem is not how these things are gamed, but the fundamental problem is that if we think the impact factor is a useful measurement for the quality of science, because I think it's just not. <laughs> yeah, this. Um, I guess I that was obvious, basically. <laughs> yeah, I, I would not say that the, the journal impact factor is a measurement of uh, scientific quality because um, no one has like um, a definition of uh, scientific quality. So what I can observe is only people believe this journal impact factor to reflect some quality and maybe they are chasing a ghost. But I, whether that's a... Uh, yeah, valid measure is not so important to me, even if it were an irrelevant or an a valid measure, it would uh, concern me how uh, it uh, affects science. Okay, question uh, from Mike from number three there, please. Yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. I have a question about the 5,000 author paper. Was it the same paper published 5,000 times, or was it one paper with 10-page title page? No, it was uh, one paper, um, uh, have a counting more than 7,000 words. And the authorship, so authors and co-authors, were more than 5,000. So, uh, 
doesn't it um, isn't it uh, obvious that this is a fake? Or, or? Well, uh, that what I what that's what I meant uh, earlier when uh, saying you have to see this uh, within its context. So um, f uh, physicists um, are working with this um, with Atlas, this detective system, and as there were some physicists in the audience. They probably do now how this works, I do not. Um, but as they uh, claim, it's so much work to, to work with this, and it's, as I said, re requires so high maintenance. It's, um, they obviously have, uh, yeah. Uh, so everybody who they, contributed was listed. Exactly. Okay. That's it. That's it. And if this is ethically correct or not, well, this is something which is, needs to be discussed, right? This is why we had this talk, uh, as we want to make this transparent and uh, uh, contribute it to, to an open discussion. Okay, yeah. uh, I'm Thanks. sorry, guys. I have to cut off here because uh, our emission out there in space is uh, <laughs> coming to an end. I suggest that you guys find each other somewhere, uh, maybe the tea house or... Sure, something. We're, we're around. Yeah. We're You're here. around. I would love to have a last applause for these ladies. <laughs> really with their Thank lights you. on how these algorithms not or are working. Thank you very Thank much. You.